everyone, welcome to The Enthusiastic Buddhist. In this episode, I want to cover some of the different postures we can sit in when doing meditation and explain some of the symbolism and meaning of each of the different postures, as well as briefly reflect on our motivation for practicing meditation. In order to meditate properly, we first need to get the body to cooperate with us. Any obstacle we experience from the body is going to affect our minds and our ability to sit still and meditate. It's good to look at each of the different postures of the body and give each posture some meaning. In fact, each posture can represent the qualities of calmness that we want to cultivate. When we do meditation, there are seven points of the body that we need to pay attention to. Together, they're called the seven point posture or the seven point posture of Verachana. The first posture is the posture of the legs. We can sit on a chair, especially if we have health or back problems, but it's better if you can sit cross-legged on the floor. If you can alternate between the chair and the floor during a session, then this will also be very good. If you're sitting on the chair, then bring your legs together and place your feet together on the floor. When sitting on the floor, there are several ways you can cross your legs. The most desirable position is the lotus position or diamond posture. This is extremely difficult for beginners and it's not necessary. There is also the half lotus position where one foot is towards the groin and the other foot sits on top of the thigh. Then there is a basic easy posture where your legs are crossed and your feet sit under each knee. Then there is the siddhasana posture where one foot is towards the groin and the other foot is in front or above the other foot. This tends to be my preferred posture. What's important is just to approximate a cross-legged posture. As mentioned in my previous episode, it's also very important to have a cushion that raises your bottom a couple of inches off the ground. This will also allow your hips to sit higher than your feet and your legs and help you to keep your back straight. Now when we meditate, it's important to be comfortable and stable to achieve focus and concentration. You should, however, avoid lying down positions as this generally enhances relaxation rather than allowing for concentration. When we're sitting, especially on the floor, we should feel a greater sense of connection with Mother Earth. This posture actually consolidates our Earth element. When we talk about our bodies, we can speak of the four elements that make up our body, such as earth, water, fire and air. It's said that if any of these four elements are depleted, then this can lead to problems in our body or even in our mental states. For example, if our bodies are lacking the earth element, we might feel restless and unstable. But when our earth element is in harmony, we'll feel stabilised, grounded and calm. Sitting in this posture harmonises our earth element. It also increases our calmness and confidence. Sitting cross-legged is also very symbolic of making a promise. It represents our determination, assertiveness, and expresses our faith that meditation can help you. It also forms a triangular shape, which symbolises a womb. So, so it's in effect re representing the rebirthing of ourselves, which here is rebirthing our spiritual selves and thus allowing for realisation. After paying attention to our legs, the second posture that's important is the posture of our hands. The right hand should sit in the top of the palm of the left hand and your thumb should be gently touching. They should rest just below your navel. Your hands are facing up and open like an open basket, which is symbolising a mind that is open and free. Only a mind that's open can experience the spaciousness and clarity that comes from meditation. In Sanskrit, this posture of the hands is known as the Dhyana Mudra meaning the gesture of deep concentration. This is the posture the Buddha sat in when he achieved enlightenment. Bringing our hands together can achieve balance and equanimity. It harmonizes our two sides and avoids the two extremes. During our meditation session, this means we can avoid the extremes of laxity and rigidity. Often when we meditate, we can be too rigid, tense or too strict on ourselves, or we might go the other way and be too relaxed and not try hard enough. Using this hand gesture can help us achieve balance in our effort. If we're experiencing pain in the body, you don't want to deny and suppress the pain and you don't want to just grin and bear it, nor do you want to straight away move at the slightest suggestion of discomfort. We have to find a middle ground, a balance, where our minds can remain calm and then allow ourselves to move or stretch after having tolerated a little bit of the discomfort. From a teaching's point of view, bringing the hands together symbolises the union of compassion and wisdom. Most of us don't combine these two very well in our everyday life. Sometimes we can be too intellectual and therefore a little bit cold and not connected with the rest of humanity. 
or we can be too compassionate to the point of suffering from compassion fatigue because perhaps we lack the wisdom to know that suffer all suffering is impermanent. During these sessions, we need to remember to have compassion for ourselves. People often come to meditation sessions with high ideals and high expectations to have no thoughts and have blissful experiences. But this exp expectation will only increase your unhappiness in meditation. It's important to be kind, forgiving and flexible and move if needed. But try to put in effort, try and achieve a goal. This is the meaning of equanimity. This hand gesture harmonises our water element. It helps us to go with the flow in meditation and in life. In meditation it means we won't get stuck on certain thoughts and feelings. So during our meditation, by remembering the meaning of the hand posture, it should help you to remember to practice equanimity and balance. The third important posture is our back. It's very important that we maintain a straight back during our meditation session. To achieve a straight back, it might be helpful to imagine that your spine is like a stacked pile of coins, or imagine a hair at the top of your head pulling you up towards the ceiling. A straight back will lead to better circulation, which will help keep you more awake and aware during your session so that you'll be able to better meditate, and you'll also experience less dullness and less distraction. The posture of the back harmonises the fire element in us. The fire element causes things to unfold, ripen and grow. If we lack the fire element, we might find that we're not changing, not maturing, not learning, always getting stuck on the same problem, or we might feel that our life is quite bland. Flames, by their very nature, ascend and move upwards. Thus the fire element will assist us to grow and move and help us to overcome past difficulties and any present obstacles in our lives. It also burn up our negativities like anger, jealousy, etc. The next posture is that of our elbows and our shoulders. Our arms should be relaxed but not pressed against our ribs. Our elbows should be a bit like two wings of a bird. If we generate heat in the body during meditation, this will allow the air to pass through and cool us. Our shoulders should be balanced and relaxed, not tight nor drooping. If our spine is naturally straight, then we'll have the shoulders in the correct position. Next, moving our attention upwards, we come to the posture of our neck. Our chin should be slightly pressed down and this allows the neck to bend for slightly forward and this is going to allow us to achieve the correct visual gaze. Moving up to our mouth, our lips should be closed so we're breathing through our nostrils. If you have any problems breathing through your nose, it's fine to breathe through your mouth. Your tongue should be slightly curled at the tip and placed behind the upper top set of teeth. There should also be a slight hint of a smile on your lips with the corner slightly curled upwards. This emulates the peaceful, happy gaze of the Buddha, in, for instance. Now, when it comes to the posture of your eyes, different meditation schools and even different Buddha schools are going to have different ideas about this. Having tried both techniques of closing my eyes and having them half open, I've come to prefer having them half open. When we begin to meditate and we close our eyes, our brain automatically thinks, oh, you must want to go to sleep. <laughs> so we can find ourselves quickly getting dull and sleeping in no time. But when we meditate with our eyes half open, we can remain awake, aware and more concentrated. At least this has been my experience. But feel free to experiment for yourself and see which technique suits you. Now, when we meditate with our eyes open, we want to have them half open and we don't want them to stare but be having a soft gaze looking about two to three feet in front of us. And you want, you want to make sure that there's nothing moving in, in the space in front of you either that's going to distract you. When we meditate, we want to achieve continuity between our formal meditation session and post-meditation session so that the concentration and calmness cultivated during our meditation session flows easily into our experience even when we're off the cushion. Now, this is one of the reasons why meditating with your eyes half open is very good because it allows that awareness and continuity to flow on because we don't tend to walk around our life with our eyes closed, for instance. Now, all the postures of your neck, mouth and eyes harmonises our air element. When we're lacking in our air element, we might feel tired and weary, but when the air element is in harmony, we feel invigorated and alive. So now I've gone over the seven point posture or seven point posture of Verachana. So you can see that each of the body's postures are expressing their own body language. In everyday life, what we think inside is often expressed outwards in our body language. We often do this unconsciously, but in meditation we try to assume postures that are going to harmonise our body and our mind and allow us to cultivate a mind of someone who's peaceful like the Buddha. Then once we have the body posture established, it's just a matter of training our mind.
Finally, I want to speak a bit about motivation, in particular our motivation before practicing meditation. As with anything in life, it's important to have a strong motivation to do something, then we're more likely to put in effort to start and continue something. Before we meditate, it's really important to have a strong and beneficial motivation. So before we begin our meditation, it's important to reflect on the reasons why we're meditating. In a previous episode, I emphasised that meditation is a way of discovering true happiness within us. One of the first benefits people will see when they meditate is they'll see themselves be to become more calm and peaceful. We really should reflect on what this means to become a peaceful people and consider the potential changes being calm will make in our lives. Being calm will not only help us solve difficult problems and situations in our lives, it will help us to cope with stresses in our lives such as illness, family problems and work problems, but it will also help us to become better people, better partners, better friends, better work colleagues. Practicing meditation effectively helps us to gather or recharge ourselves so that we're better able to help others. It's a small but important point that although we meditate to help ourselves, we should recognise that if we really look within, we'll see that we're not just meditating for ourselves, but to be of benefit to others. It may be helpful to find some nice card or paper and write down your motivation for practising on it. This way you can keep it hidden somewhere near your meditation spot, so whenever you feel like giving up, you can take it out and read it. This will help set your motivation, inspire you during the practice and enable you to finish the meditation session no matter how many difficulties you encounter. So that concludes the explanation on how we correctly position our bodies for the practice of meditation and what the correct motivation should be. In the next episode I'll be giving instructions on how we actually meditate now that we're familiar with the postures. If you have any questions about what I've covered in this episode, feel free to leave it in the comments section below or you can connect with me on my website, enthusiasticbuddhist.com or Facebook and Twitter. So that's all from me for now. Take care and I hope to see you in the next episode.